Welcome to today's Zoo to You here from Stone Zoo. We are currently in our crane exhibit and we're going to talk today about whooping cranes. So here today we have Alec and Sunflower who are not only beautiful animals but they also play a crucial role in the survival of the whooping crane species. So there are only about 800 whooping cranes left in the world and we are so lucky to have these two right here with us. And I'm going to back out of the frame because as you can see the cranes are rather large birds and we want to let them enjoy their snacks in peace. So whooping cranes are actually the tallest bird in North America. They stand five feet tall but their wingspan is even more impressive. They can, their wingspan ranges from six and a half feet to seven and a half feet, which is like having Shaquille O'Neal laying down sideways. Maybe if we're lucky, they'll show us their wingspan today. So Alec is 19 years old. He's our male. Sunflower is actually only seven years old. Both of them, however, weighed in at their last weigh-in at 12 and a half pounds. So whooping cranes in the wild can live as long between 22 and 30 years. And as mo with most animals in our zoo, these animals might live a little bit longer. And they have complete diet, they have good veterinary care, and most importantly, they're protected from any predators. So I don't know if we can see, right now Jen is tossing them some grain from their diet, but cranes are actually omnivores. In the wild, they would eat fish, small reptiles, frogs, crabs, birds, plants, and berries. And what we're looking over here, our female, she's the one who's on the land right now, she's actually the primary hunter of this two pair. In the wild, whooping cranes live in a wetland area, which is similar to our exhibit here. They live on the Gulf Coast in the United States, but they spend their summers in Canada and the Northwest US. In the wild, their predators would be anything from a bear to a wolf, to a mountain lion, to even an alligator. But the biggest predator of the whooping crane has and continues to be human beings. So here it is in 2020 and whooping cranes are an endangered species. Just 80 years ago, however, the whooping crane was at the brink of extinction. There are 15 species of crane and whooping cranes have historically been the most rare of all cranes. When the European settlers arrived in North America, it's estimated that only 10,000 whooping cranes lived in the U.S. and in Canada. By 1941, however, only 15 whooping cranes were surviving. The crane population had been decimated by the settlers hunting the birds, collecting their eggs, and developing uh, their habitats, which are the wetlands. But the good news is, since 1941, a comprehensive effort has been made to save the whooping cranes. And this has been accomplished through the cooperation of the United States government, the Canadian government, nonprofit conservation and rescue groups, and AZA accredited zoos such as Stone Zoo. This coordinated effort to save the whooping cranes has been difficult for a few reasons. The first reason is that cranes typically only produce one viable offspring at a time. So the reproduction rate doesn't lend for a lot of accumulation of young cranes. The whooping crane habitats, as I mentioned, the wetlands that they live in, have also been continued to be destroyed by agricultural installations, building development, oil and gas exploration, and actually even intercoastal waterways. Plus, natural events uh, with weather, like hurricanes and bad storms, have killed birds and demolished their breeding grounds along the Gulf Coast. In the face of these obstacles, however, researchers have taken great measures to help save the whooping cranes. The first measure is to develop captive breeding programs. And researchers, if you can believe it, have gone so far as to dress up in full body crane costumes. And they do this to encourage the cranes to breed. Before whooping cranes breed, they engage in a series of loud whoops and calls, which is actually why they're called whooping cranes, and elaborate dances. So the researchers dress up like male cranes to try to entice the females to be in the mood for breeding. Another thing researchers have done is to use crane puppets to help train young cranes how to be adult cranes and survive when they're reintroduced into the wild. 
also, and this brings our story a little bit closer to home, in an attempt to establish a migratory flock on the east coast of the U.S., the recovery program launched what's called Operation Migration, which featured the use of ultralight aircraft to teach the young cranes the migration route between Florida and Wisconsin. And our very own Alec was one of the first participants in Operation Migration. If any of you have ever seen the movie called Fly Away Home, it shows a young girl and her dad using an ultralight aircraft to teach geese how to migrate. And that's very much the same thing that happened with Operation Migration. Finally, as part of the recovery effort for the whooping cranes, AZA accredited zoos such as Stone Zoo began to participate in the recovery program. So Alec and Sunflower came to Stone Zoo as a potential breeding pair. Stone Zoo is happy to care for Alec and Sunflower. We're happy to share their story with our visitors, but with any part of the recovery program, any viable eggs that Sunflower and, and Alec might produce are actually turned over to U.S. Fish and Wildlife so that these chicks can be reintroduced into the wild and help get those numbers up of the flock. So here we are again, it's 2020. There are only about 800 whooping cranes in the world the only naturally occurring flock of whooping cranes migrates between the Gulf Coast of Texas and Canada every winter. That's the largest group of whooping cranes. In the US, there are also smaller non-migratory groups in Florida and Louisiana, as well as those that can be found in AZA accredited zoos. So if you are a member of Stone Zoo or Franklin Park Zoo and you make a visit to Stone Zoo, you are actually helping the Whooping Crane Recovery Program. So I think if we have any questions, we have some time. Yeah, so we've had a couple of questions come through. Um, so these guys, they look the same. Um, you, you mentioned that they were the same weight. So how can you tell Alec and Sunflower apart? <laughs> That's a great question. So I don't know, Brian, how close you can zoom in on Alec and Sunflower, but if you look closely at their legs, Sunflower is the furthest away from the camera shot. She has one white band on her leg but Alec, who's in the front, has, I believe it's two green bands and one red band, and one of our zookeepers affectionately calls him Christmas, because it's the easiest way for him to remember. So usually those bands are the easiest way for us to tell them apart. All right, and Linda is asking, um, what do they eat? Oh, what do they eat at the zoo? That's a great question. So while we were getting ready to film, we were watching the cranes eating from their bowl, and they get uh, they get small fish, they get some meat, and a grain mix which has some pellets and dried corn. And interestingly enough, every time they took a fish or a hunk of meat out of their bowl, they dipped it in the pond before they ate it. All right, Denise is wondering, who are their predators? Oh, well, so it depends apparently where they're living. If we have um, birds in captivity, still our biggest predator, for the, those in the wild are gonna be people because we're destroying their wetlands, but also it could be other animals. So if it was the winter time or the summertime, it could be anything from a bird to a mountain lion or another big cat or a fox. Uh, could even be an alligator if they're by the water. Right, Denise is also wondering how many eggs do they lay? That's a great question. So usually cranes only lay one or two eggs at one clutch but only one egg usually survives. All right, and Steve wants to know if they migrate. Well, they do. Some birds do and some birds don't. So unfortunately, the operation migration to develop that migratory flock between Wisconsin and Florida didn't quite work out as well as they wanted. So most of the birds in Florida don't migrate. There's also a pair, uh, a set of recovery program birds in Louisiana. And all of the birds, by the way, that we've mentioned where they live in the U.S. and in Canada are protected by those governments. And can you just tell us where did Sunflower and Alec come from? <laughs> so that's, that's also a great question. So Alec, as I mentioned, was one of the pioneer birds in the Operation Migration. So he actually came to us directly from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which is the government agency that runs the recovery program. And then Sunflower came to us from Calgary as a potential mate for Alec. Awesome. Um, and then Jen is wondering, did these two ever whoop? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
they do whoop. Uh, they usually, they're very quiet right now, of course, because they're on camera. But <laughs> any time of the day, you can hear them whooping and calling and sometimes spreading their feathers and doing the little dances that, oh, I think Alec might be giving us a show. Thank you, Alec. Well timed. <laughs> so they do. Awesome. So I think those are all of the questions that we have for right now. Um, but you know, again, feel free to keep sending in your questions and we can always try to answer those later for you in the comments. And come visit us and come visit Alec and Sunflower at Stone Zoo.